is torn at the seams. It's getting harder and harder to see. Good morning and welcome to worship at Meadow Lake Presbyterian Church located in Huntersville, North Carolina. I'm the Reverend Siobhan Starling Lewis and I am blessed to be the pastor here at this lovely church. We are a small church called to make a big impact in our community and in the lives of each other. We are a Matthew 25 church. Matthew 25 initiative is one that is committed to eradicating systemic poverty, dismantling systemic racism, and what Meadow Lake is particularly dedicated to, creating a vital congregation, one that is full of life and purpose. This is the third Sunday of Lent, and we have been living into the theme of again and again, a Lenten refrain. And I am overjoyed to be able to share with you something that I have been doing for many Lents. The Next Church Movement, uh, a group for which I'm very blessed to be a part of the leadership and a member and one who's learning alongside others, uh, has been having their national gathering during the Lenten season. And we have had it this weekend. And I am blessed that I get to introduce a bit of our Next Church family to our Meadow Lake Church family. So in our worship today, this is actually the closing worship service for the Next Church gathering, and we are blessed to be able to bring it to Meadow Lake this day. We ask that you continue to hold in prayers the fullness of the congregation. We ask for prayers for Chris and Jana and Bree, for Hugh and Leslie, for Dick and Sally, for Donna, for Sarah Lee. We ask for prayers for those who are struggling with mobility, those who are sick and ill, those who are mourning in these days. We ask for those who still do not have fresh water in Texas and in other Southern states and those states throughout our nation. We lift up those who are starting a new school year and for the transitions that are taking place. And we ask for prayers as we look towards reopening our worship service. We are looking towards Easter Sunday being our big day of celebration, pending no new guidelines that would prohibit it from being so. In the next few weeks, beginning next week, the worship team will be here live, and those who would like to can as well. We are blessed that again and again we can come to worship God. So let us worship God with the fullness of our heart as we look with Next Church of this theme of breaking, blessing, building, a call for the common good. Let us go with God in worship. Everything 
to God surrendered. Thankfully, I wait for thee. My heart is open and my thoughts unbroken. Breathing with my source, I'm free. I surrender all. I surrender. Welcome to the final worship service of Next Church. I invite you to join me in heart and in voice as we are called to worship. I'll invite your response with my hands and you'll also see it on the screen. We come to this space to renew our commitment to you, God, to each other, and to all those your love calls us to serve. Together, we commit to the work of breaking, blessing, and building for the common good. We come aware the work requires all we can give. It will disorient and unsettle us. It will humble us. And it will also reveal the glory of God in ways that startle and delight us. Together, we commit to the work of breaking, blessing, and building for the common good. We come offering our whole selves to you, the one who made us, who calls us good, and who calls us to abundant life, an abundance not just for us, but for all your people, indeed, the whole creation. Together, we commit to the work of breaking, blessing, and building for the common good. Friends, let's raise our voices together and continue the work that we have committed to do. Let us worship God. We are building up a new world. 
We are building up a new world. We Must be strong. We are building up a new world, and builders must be strong. Sing along with me, please. We are building. some signs of sacred strength that you're seeing in yourself, in your communities. Why don't you write it in the chat and share it with one another as we sing the next verse. Courage, people, don't get weary. Courage, people. of prophetic courage in yourself and in your communities? Won't you share that with one another as we go on with the next verse? Every day hope grows deeper. Every day. sacred hope in your communities and in yourself. Won't you share that with one another as we continue singing, we are building, we Let us break open our hearts as we receive the blessings of forgiveness, trusting in God who is building a confessional, compassionate church. Dios Todopoderoso y de gracia, te confesamos que no hemos caído con todo nuestro corazón. 
Te damos las obras de nuestra alma. Te damos solo parte de nuestros pensamientos. Nos rendimos a ti solamente con una pequeña parte de nuestra fuerza. Oh, tu fuente de todo. This is not your will for us. This is not faithful. This is sinful. This is broken. En tu piedad de visión, bendícenos con tu perdón, que nos inspira para mejorar nuestras vidas y el amor hacia ti, a nuestros vecinos y a nosotros mismos. Hear the good news. God is making, crafting, building, and rebuilding all things new, including us. Quien está con Cristo es una nueva creación. La vida pasada se ha ido y la vida nueva ha iniciado. Trust and believe the good news of the gospel in all your affairs. In Jesus Christ, you are forgiven. Thanks be to God. Demos gracias a Dios. Gracious God, we give you praise for the gift of your holy word that refreshes us and renews us and makes us whole. Gracious God, we give you praise for the gift of your word that is a lamp unto our feet and a light unto our path. Spirit of the living God, fall afresh on us. Spirit of the living God, fall afresh on us. Melt us, mold us, fill us, use us. Spirit of the living God, fall afresh on us. Hello and welcome church. It is truly a blessing to be able to bring a sermon to you these days. It is an even better and wider blessing to be able to work together as the church. I am excited to bring to you just a portion of the closing worship for Next Church's 2021 National Gathering, a gathering that is grounded in the theme of breaking, blessing, building, a call for the common good. Hi, I'm the Reverend Siobhan Starling Lewis, and aside from serving on Next Church's leadership, I'm also a PCUSA pastor, pastoring here at Meadow Lake Presbyterian Church in Huntersville, North Carolina. And I also enjoy and find great passion for the work of being an anti-oppression church leadership facilitator. For those of you who have been sharing the good news, ministering, sharing your stories, listening and learning in community, falling down and slowly sometimes getting back up as siblings connected in the movement of Next Church. It is truly a blessing to be with you again. I cannot believe that the last time I stepped my foot on a plane was on my return flight from last year's national gathering. It has been quite a year, friends. Amen. And for those of you who might not have ever heard of Next Church until you just heard me mention it or you saw it somehow on your bulletin that we'd be providing the sermon for the day, 
I am equally excited to see you. It is a blessing to meet you, dear siblings. For those who know me for any length of time, they can genuinely attest that I'm a pretty big lover of the church. Okay, frankly and awkwardly, I will attest that I love Jesus and I love Jesus' people. I feel honored on a regular basis to support those who are desiring to follow Christ. Particularly in these days, those who desire to live out their ministry, those who are living it out as if their full life were a prayer to God. I'm excited. I'm excited that I get to be a vessel for Jesus' liberating love in the present, in the breaking, in the blessing, and in the building. As Christ of Nazareth chose to very intentionally identify with the breaking of hearts and the blessing of the binding up of those shards and shattered pieces and the beckoning forth of the building and the rebuilding of an empathetic world of compassionate wounded healers. I'm excited to be a part of the church these days. Church, beloved faith community that has nurtured me, church, Beloved ones who have allowed me to nurture you, I need you to hear these words in these days loudly and clearly. You are magnificent. You are glorious. Because at your core, at the very center and base of who we are called to be, empowered by the Holy Spirit, there is a desire to be like Mary, mother of Jesus. There is a desire to magnify and glory God, to make large, to project out loud about the God of all. At the center of our being, there is a desire to project on the screen that is our lives, Jehovah Jireh, God who provides all, all that we are called to steward, all that we are called to carry together, all that we are called to hold in common, especially each other. At our best, we have historically built up and edified our society with places of hope and healing. We built hospitals and schools. At our best, we developed shelters and pantries and affordable housing. We crafted programs and policies and lessons and language and practices that embrace all of God's precious children. We, church, have magnificently and gloriously held space in our worship and in our lives for compassionate lamentation and grief alongside those who are brokenhearted, grief, alongside those who have been impaled by broken systems. In a chaotic and busy world, we as the church, magnificent and glorious, have held space in our prayers and in our written constitutions, individually and communally, we've confessed and offered clarity to the collective call to repent and repair calls to be a blessing in the broken places of the world. At our best, we have looked for the whys and the hows of what we do in our ministry as we attempt to be more faithful and yet imperfect and live into the great call to love God with our whole heart and our soul and our mind and all of our strength and to love our neighbors as ourselves. So it is with deep love that I come to you. I've been watching. I've been listening, I've been feeling, I've been noticing, I've been praying. And it seems that we've got a problem. We've got behaviors that we compulsively and automatically and mindlessly do. And more than that, we have habits and tendencies that set us up to do the very thing that our convictions say we shouldn't do. And in the middle of all these patterns of behavior, we hurt those that we mean to love and we hurt ourselves. Church, we are addicted to white supremacy culture, evident in the normalization of a white type of worship as normal. The songs that we sing, the examples that we give in our illustrations, the theologians that we pick up, those voices we choose to make vulnerable in our worship spaces. They're a reflection of this addiction. We are addicted to the comforts that are afforded to a church willing to ally itself with a power over or a power under rather than a power with each other. 
our budgets and our behaviors reflect a deeper love of our endowments and our physical buildings than the hurting community around us at times. I'm reminded that we remain addicted to the lie that there is not enough when we serve a God of abundance. The lie that people, some people, are not enough when they are made in the image of God. We, out of fear that someone with deep pockets or deep influence might leave, well, we choose instead deadly silence when God is calling us to speak. In our perpetual celebration of our frozen chosenness, we have a cold, hard heart at times and been still as a rock when we are called to speak out, when we are called to move, to walk, to march, to even dance humbly with our God in the faithful requirements to act for justice and embody loving kindness. Church, we have an oppression obsession. We invest in support, create, and are complicit and condone societal structures that deal in the death dealing and suffering, particularly of those who are differently abled, those in poverty, those who are neurodiverse, those black, indigenous, people of color, queer siblings, those who are abused and addicted. We tend to not value them as much in our spaces those in the midst of our community that are us. At large, there is suffering. And there is even unto death. But yet, know that we are capable in our magnificence, in our gloriousness that we have been designed as the church and called to be, to actually be different. And so I pray that in the clarifying light of the pandemic, an overt attempt to overthrow our constitution and the emblazoned image of a lethal lynching knee on the neck of Mr. George Perry Floyd Jr., who's directly, which directly correlates to the lethal lynching tree that was fashioned to a cross that we walk to in this Lenten season for Mary and Joseph's baby boy breathed his last. Well, I'm prayerful that we won't stay the same that we have hit our rock bottom. And while we might be tempted to say, no, that's not happening here, or dismiss it equally as, well, that may be happening here, but that's too big of a problem to deal with as just our church. I invite you to take in, in this moment, a deep breath. Breathe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Wind, the Holy Breath, and remember in a Sankofa kind of way that we have been created to be the church Take in that holy ruach, holy pneuma wind, and be unashamed that we can get our healing. We can go back and get it. We can go towards wholeness. We don't need to just think about ourselves, but we can think of the future generations to come. Friends, some of you know this and some of you don't. I have served churches in Florida, in Rhode Island, in Oklahoma, in Georgia, and in North Carolina. I've worked in rural spaces, urban spaces, suburban communities. I have held in my heart your stories from Washington State to Washington, D.C., from St. Louis to Denver to Des Moines. And I can say with conviction that I'm not making this up. We have a problem, we need help. We have to overcome this obsession, this oppression obsession. We need a breaking, we need a blessing, we need a building to do so. And I genuinely believe that the answer might be right underneath our nose or right underneath our butts that are sitting in pews if you're back in your building. If your church is anything like our church, we had a basement underneath it in Rhode Island. And it was in that space that the most miraculous work was happening, I believe. An answer to what at, is at at hand for the church. The unused educational room down the hall that gets filled to the brim during weekday evenings. Or maybe in these days it's gone by phone or online. I think in this Lenten season we are given some practices in particular to introduce a new way to walk and talk and live. And so I invite you across the threshold that I am familiar with. It is a threshold that for some of us is unfamiliar and some of us it will be a colliding of worlds. We have personally 
I have personally found shalom and healing and wellness in the spaces. And I have seen the miraculous break forth in these sacred places that are right around the corner. I would be honored, church, is if in this time together, I could introduce you to the practices of the 12 steps, those same 12 steps that have helped some of us and our siblings overcome and recover from addictions to alcohol and narcotics and pornography and overeating and codependency and broken relationships and many, many, many other compulsive behaviors. I believe that there is a gift for the church this day in that space. I genuinely believe the church can apply those steps in our common life. And to do so, we will find recovery and rebuild in a way that is not about perfection, but is about faithfulness. As much as we hear the word 12 steps, many of us don't know what they are. And so I invite you into this mini meeting we're gonna have. It just so happens to be my day to share but those in my community will lift up the words from our great big book that is the Bible and allow it to inform our time together. But first, I've got to change, literally. For in those rooms, things like robes and stoles have no meaning. In these rooms, I come as I am. And so give me a minute and I'll see you in the circle. Hi church, I'm Suzanne. Welcome to our circle. I will be reading from Acts 2 and steps 1 through 3. When the day of Pentecost came, they were all together in one place. Suddenly, a sound like the blowing of violent wind came from heaven and filled the whole house where they were sitting. They saw what seemed to be tongues of fire that separated and came to rest on each of them. All of them were filled with Holy Spirit and began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit enabled them. Step one, we admitted we were powerless above our addiction, that our lives had become unmanageable. Step two, came to believe that a power greater than ourselves could restore us to sanity. Step three, made a decision to turn our will and our lives over to the care of God as we understood God. What a gift to hear those first three steps. The reality is, as Christians in the United States, in our context, it is impossible to not be affected and infected with thoughts of and behaviors about dominating the other or thinking who's above the other. Our thoughts and our behaviors are seriously impaled by views of white supremacy, individualism, senses of urgency, either or thinking that says somebody's gotta be over somebody else. It binds up our imagination. This is not something that we can undo for ourselves. We have been breathing it in our air since before we were knowing what breath was. We inherited it, but like a home that we inherit, we can make it better, particularly when the roof is falling in and hurting the people that we love. We can do better when it comes to working alongside each other. We can say what needs to be said and in our first three steps, we hear a theology of open surrender to God, to the holy God who is able to do more than we can ever imagine, to have the ability to do what we otherwise would be powerless to do for ourselves. We, in the power of the triune God offered by the Holy Spirit, we can stop this insanity of broken and sinful ways that turn us against each other, that looks for a bad person and a good person in every situation. And instead, we can embrace this posture of open surrender and care for all that God has sent us anew. But it is vulnerable. It's vulnerable to recognize that there is something unmanageable in our lives. So church, how will we do this? Will we do this? How will we develop practices where we can embrace the vulnerability in order to be able to embrace the theology of surrender before God so we may walk these steps? 
Hi church, I'm Kirk. I will share some more of Acts 2 and steps 4 through 6. Then Peter stood up with the eleven, raised his voice and addressed the crowd, fellow Jews and all of you who live in Jerusalem, let me explain this to you. Listen carefully to what I have to say. These people are not drunk, as you suppose. It's only nine in the morning. No, this is what was spoken by the prophet Joel. In the last days, God says, your sons and daughters will prophesy. Your young men will see visions. Your old men will dream dreams. Even on my servants, both men and women, I will pour out my spirit in those days and they will prophesy. I will show you wonders in the heavens above and signs on the earth below. Blood and fire and billows of smoke. Made a searching and fearless mortal inventory of ourselves. Step five, admitted to God, to ourselves and to another human being, the exact nature of our wrongs. Step six, where we are entirely ready to have God remove all these defects of our character. Church, it really is remarkable just how much the story of Acts, this story that is our birth story, so beautifully aligns with the 12 steps. Our origin story as the church is a story of unity in the midst of diversity, coming from different places, yet speaking in one language and connecting with each other. As reflected in the last portion of scripture, people from all over the world came and they understood what God was up to and they didn't even understand why. That is the work that we're called into. To be a less oppressive church means that we should expect to not really always understand everything, to know that there are dynamics at play bigger than ourselves and that there is an importance in coming together as a community to confess where we have as individually and communally as the church been a part of this brokenness. It is an invitation to self-reflection in community. We need to do a searching and fearless inventory, name within our community, and do so in a way that is creative and life-giving, that holds space for lamentation and for tears. For indeed, we may find things about ourselves that we never would have otherwise seen, but in doing so, we become freed from it. There is liberation work at hand. We can be removed and made free from those dysfunctional, stifling habits that say, we don't talk about that here. Peter stands in as an example for us in these scriptures. He's saying it out loud, what he sees in the moment. He looks to the actual character of the faithful through time. He goes back to the prophet Joel. He knows his story is connected to the generations before, and he pushes away those forces around him that would have a tendency to have somebody else write the story. No, ironically, they don't have a drinking problem. Instead, he points to God's giftedness in the moment. He is pointing to a church and a way of being that dreams and visions and prophesies what is to be in the world. He is removing the scales that make us short-sighted and there's an invitation for us to do the same so they won't be fearful and terrorized by our truest character if we find faults there. So church, when was the last time as a community you gathered and shared the stories? Maybe the stories that need to be held with space for lament, or maybe the stories that are your church's wildest dreams and visions. Hello, I'm Terry, and I will continue reading and share steps seven through nine. Fellow Israelites, listen to this. Jesus of Nazareth was a man accredited by God to you by miracles, wonders, and signs, which God did among you through him, as you yourselves know. This man was handed over to you by God's deliberate plan and foreknowledge, and you, with the help of wicked men, put him to death, 
by nailing him to the cross. Therefore, let all Israel be assured of this. God has made this Jesus, whom you crucified, both Lord and Messiah. When the people heard this, they were cut to the heart and said to Peter and the other apostles, Brothers, what shall we do? Peter replied, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the forgiveness of your sins. And you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. Step seven, humbly ask God to remove our shortcomings. Step eight, make a list of all persons we had harmed and became willing to make amends to them all. Step nine, may direct amends to such people wherever possible, except when to do so would injure them or others. Peter's continued conversations to the crowd is as once a conversation correction. Again, no, they're not drunk, and he wants clearly for them to know that, but it's also an intervention invitation. Another way to look at what it means to understand what's going on in this communal learning opportunity. A way to, as he says, cut to the heart of each other. To really get to the core of what it means to be connected. Peter sojourns through the past and places Jesus' suffering, Jesus' resurrection in the context of those in his midst. He wants so much for them to learn. Church, the 12 steps are here for us as gifts, as opportunities, incredible ones indeed, invitations to learn and to live and to live with those learnings differently. And one of the leading gifts of this is that we return to step number one and that we're not able to remove our own shortcomings, but instead we are to turn them over to God. We have to learn from our past, not hide it, not run away from it. So often a part of anti-racism training and oppression work, anti-oppression work, is where we feel the most amount of resistance occurring. It is so much easier, church, I know, to talk about, to gossip about other peoples, other denominations who are worse than us, other congregations who are worse than us, other people who are worse than us, and none of that is our business. Instead, then, it is our call to learn by looking in the mirror, to learn by looking into the eyes of those for whom we, we have injured. It becomes harder, even harder for many of us to learn that there is a gift to and embracing the blessing of real relationship, where we're guided on how to truly heal and connect and repair what we've broken. Reparations for what has been broken, what needs to be made amends for. This is something we can learn. We need to learn as the church. To do so is to see the blessing that was prophesied by Isaiah, one of being builders and faithful rebuilders, one of raising the foundations for the future generations, one of being repairers of the breach, one of being restorers of the streets that we live in. That is the kind of work we're called to. That is what Peter is pointing to. That is what the Holy Spirit enables us to do. What would it look like if the church in our local context and nationally and globally did this kind of working of the steps together? A way of repentance, a way of turning to God. I close out with our final reading from our big book that is the Bible, with our last three steps as well. Acts 2 ends like this. And they devoted themselves to the apostles' teachings and fellowship and breaking bread and to prayer. Everyone was filled with awe at the many wonders and signs performed by the apostles. All the believers were together and had everything in common. And they sold their property and possessions to give to anyone who was in need. And every day they continued to meet together in the temple courts and they broke bread in their homes and they ate together and they had glad and sincere hearts, praising God and enjoying the favor of all the people. 
and the Lord added to their number daily those who were being saved. The final three steps are these. Step 10, taking, continuing to take a personal inventory and when we were wrong, promptly admitted it. Step 11, sought prayer and meditation to improve our conscious contact with God as we understood God, praying only for the knowledge of God's will for us and the power to carry it out. Step 12, having had a spiritual awaken as a result of these steps, we tried to carry this message to other addicts to practice these principles in all our affairs. As I mentioned at the beginning of my sermon, this year's national gathering is all about breaking and blessing and building a call for the common good. And in this portion of the scripture and in these last three steps, we see a profession of what it looks like to once again be the church that holds everything in common, holds up the common good above all else. So Make, step 10 makes it clear that that's the kind of community we are called to co-create with God. And it's not about perfection, but it is about humility. This is mutual accountability. This is mutual love. This is not attending to the paralysis of spirit that is obsessed of if we are a good person or not, but instead looks for and accepts the impact of our actions regardless of its intentions. Step 11 discloses the necessity for the centrality of prayer and meditation. Time with God, praising God, enjoying God is our call. And then step 12, which prompts us back to step one, is having done this spiritual awakening of doing this work, we carry it forth to those around us who are in the same struggles. And we practice these principles in all of our affairs. This is exactly the posture that we need in order to stay in contact with the common good, in order to build the kind of foundation differently. 2020 and now 2021 has taught us many a things. And one of those things I pray down to my core is that we understand what we actually hold in common and what's at stake when we don't pay attention to it. Church, friends, siblings, how will we find a way to break what needs to be broken, to bless what needs to be blessed, to build what needs to be built in this place for the common good and place it at the center of our work and the center of all our affairs. However, you are called to do this work. Don't be afraid to take the first step. I close with the gift of this time together with you, with a version of Reinhold Niebuhr's prayer that closes many of these sacred circles. It's often referred to as the serenity prayer. Join with us as we say it. God, grant me the serenity to accept the things I cannot change, the courage to change the things I can, and the wisdom to know the difference. Amen.
Siblings in Christ, fellow travelers on the way, our path is always one that moves both inward and outward, inviting us into deep personal honesty and transformation and calling us out into the world to share good news and to work for the common good. In this worship service and in this conference, we've each been invited to ask what needs to be broken, what needs to be blessed, and what needs to be built. These are not rhetorical questions. They are deeply spiritual, deeply humbling, deeply invitational. They are questions that invite a response, an action. In this time of response and offering, you are invited to discern from all you have seen and heard and felt in this gathering and in this worship service with the totality of your body, with your rational, critical mind, with the emotion and intuition of your heart and gut, with the groundedness of your feet, with the desire in your body to move. So take a deep breath and let it out. Pull out a sheet of paper, a journal, the notes on your e-reader, and pay attention to your mind, your heart, your hands and your feet. Ask what needs to be broken what needs to be blessed, and what needs to be built. And make commitments to yourself, to the common good, and to God to act in your life and in the life of the world toward the promises of God's kingdom. Enviado soy de Dios Mano lista está a construir con él un mundo fraternal. Enviado soy de Dios, mi mano lista está a construir con él un mundo fraternal. Los ángeles no son enviados a cambiar un mundo de dolor en un mundo de paz. Me ha tocado a mí hacer lo real.
Siblings, we have been blessed with a time to worship together and to learn together. May we leave this time clearer on what it is God is calling us to do, to break what needs to be broken, to bless what needs to be blessed, and to build what needs to be built, all to the glory of God, who empowers us by the Holy Spirit to love each other. At the end of many 12-step meetings, we offer these words of encouragement to each other. It works if you work it, and we're worth it. So let us work it. Go in peace to love and serve the Lord now and always. Amen. Thank you.